Hey, good morning, Firecatchers. This is Andrea York with Catch the Fire Worship Flags, and you're watching the Firecatchers classroom this morning. We have Rosie Bowden teaching Stir Up the Gift, Stirring Up the Gift. And um, we're just, we, it, we've taken a little bit of a, a break. Uh, so this is the first time in a, in a while that we've been doing the Firecatchers classroom. So if you're catching us live, um, so great that you guys are here. And if you're going to be watching this later, uh, I pray that you were going to be uh, just as blessed as we are in this conversation. So I just want to pray a blessing um, over, over Rosie before we begin. Father, I thank you that we um, have this precious teaching. Thank you for the teaching gift that Rosie has, that she imparts, that she's been, um, that you've put something on her heart to share with us, that we would be blessed by it, that it would, we would go into our day and weekend, um, and that this just, that she would be sowing a seed in our lives, um, and that the seed would bear fruit. So thank you, Lord, for her gift. We just bless her mightily in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, fire catchers, and thank you for those of you that are joining us this morning and those of you that will join us um, later down the road. I am teaching this morning on stirring up the gift. Um, <clears throat> my text is, uh, or my teaching is from the text, the scripture, 2 Timothy 1, verse 6 through 9, and I'm going to read the Passion Translation. And Paul writes, I'm writing to encourage you to fan into flame and rekindle the fire of the spiritual gift God imparted to you when I laid my hands upon you. For God will never give you the spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. He gave us resurrection life and drew us to himself by his holy calling on our lives. And it wasn't because of any good we have done, but by his divine pleasure and marvelous grace, that conformed our union with the anointed Jesus even before time began. And so I know that the reason why we are a community has to do specifically with um, worshiping with flags, being praise dancers, praise worshipers, and the like. And yet <clears throat> we all carry that gift within us, and that is specifically the gift of Holy Spirit. And of course, we also know that Holy Spirit comes with a camaraderie of gifts um, that we get to, to um, distribute through our lives as we step into our own callings, our own areas of ministry, and even, even our homes, even as wives and mothers and brothers and fathers, and just we get to distribute, oh, hallelujah, the gift of Holy Spirit. And while the gift of Holy Spirit we know comes with fruits as well. The things that um, should be a very uh, common denominator in our lives, um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, <coughs> long suffering <laughs> and self-control. <laughs> we also have gifts that, uh, ministerial gifts that accompany that. So I've pulled apart some of those ideas with the idea to remind you there is a gift of God in you and it needs to be stirred up, um, rekindled. That scripture talks about two different things, stirring and rekindling. So of course, I, you know, we all have sat, hopefully, most all of us, I forget some of you live on the East Coast, <laughs> but many of us have sat next to a roaring fire. And oftentimes as that fire begins to burn down, the only thing that we can see to recognize that that fire is still burning is those coals, those, those, those embers down at the bottom. And the minute you take a stick and begin to stir those coals up, whoa, feel the spirit, that fire will just emerge. And we know that if we blow on a fire, that it will cause it to fan into flame. That's what Paul is alluding to. Because oftentimes when our gifts and our callings they dormant, meaning we haven't had uh, an open door to utilize what God has called us to do, or we've just set it down, we've put it on a shelf, and yet those embers, oh, come on, wow, are still in there burning, just waiting for the opportunity to be stirred up and blown into and rekindled. So it's our responsibility to fan with all of our heart to keep the embers of our holy calling from burning out because they will burn out. 
And the motive of our gift is always love for the needs and the ministry of one another. Of course, 1 Corinthians 13. So above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which you run. Um, all of my scriptural translations, by the way, are passion translations for those of you who often ask. <clears throat> So to stir, I've identified in your syllabus, is to move or to cause someone or something to move after being still. To be active or busy, to agitate it, which I found quite interesting. To cause a change of position, to raise to activity, to call forth, provoke, and disturb. I really appreciate the concepts of the definitions where Paul says to stir stir it and then when you bring those uh, defining words into it means to also provoke or to agitate it and I don't know about you but I have had the Holy Spirit um, agitate me <laughs> many many times relevant to my gifts and um, I can share a few of those as we go into the defining of those um, my notes indicate who are you in him what has God equipped you to do? What gifts do you carry that enhance the call of God in your life? Again, most of us are worshipers of some type. Most of us are flag worshipers, flag dancers, praise dancers, um, instructors, leaders, etc. But again, these gifts are uh, a part of all of that. Every believer, according to 1 Peter 4.10, Every believer has received grace gifts. So use them to serve one another as faithful stewards of the many colored tapestry of God's grace. I love that translation part right there, many colored. I mean, how much more does that speak to us as we are displaying flags of color <clears throat> with a language all their own? I just really appreciate that because God <clears throat> has authored and finished our gifts and our calling. And I love that Paul writes that every believer has received. And sometimes I think that most of us have um, this belief that, um, so let's just use flag ministry, that that is our gift and our calling. But that's not always the case. Um, and as we explore the Word of God, we discover that He is a multifaceted, multicolored tapestry of gifts and callings that will partner and complement what we also do in, in flag ministry, for example, um, in our jobs, at home, um, walking down the street, in our churches. There is an affiliation and an association with not just what we do, but who we are in him. Romans 12, 6 says, God's marvelous grace imparts to each one of us varying gifts and ministries that are uniquely ours. Now, I've chosen to kind of um, explore the grace gifts according to Romans 12. There's also um, the gifts, uh, specifically the fivefold ministry gifts that are defined, <clears throat> as well as other gifts in 1 Corinthians uh, that's over in 12. And so, but for purpose of this classroom, I've, I've pulled out specifically of the grace gifts according to Romans 12. So, if you also have, in fact, let me, um, I'm going to just grab my, my Bible and read that whole, uh, was it prepared to do that? Excuse me while I grab my glasses. So oh, sorry. Uh, so join me over in Romans 12, uh, and I am down around verse 6. God's marvelous grace imparts to each one of us varying gifts and ministries that are uniquely ours, and I love that. So, if God has given you the grace gift of prophecy, you must activate your gift by using the proportion of faith you have to prophesy. If your grace gift is serving, then thrive in serving others well. If you have the grace gift of teaching, then be actively teaching and training others. 
If you have the grace gift of encouragement, then use it often to encourage others. If you have the grace gift of giving to meet the needs of others, then may you prosper in your generosity without any fanfare. If you have the gift of leadership, be passionate about your leadership. And if you have the gift of showing compassion, then flourish in your cheerful display of compassion. So that's where I pulled the scriptures from, according to the grace gifts in Romans 12. So a way to stir up those gifts I've made note of. If you have the gift of prophecy, stir it up by, according to the word, using the proportion of faith you have to prophesy. Now, for those of us that do have a prophetic gifting, I think that uh, I love how Paul attributed faith to the gift of prophecy because it's one of, I think it can be one of the scariest giftings. As I was uh, alluding to, giving uh, uniquely, as Paul writes, that um, every believer has received a grace gift to serve one another. And the other part about um, how, the, how God has uniquely uh, determined the gift that he's distributing to each one of us. And so the gift of prophecy is um, quite unique. I know for me that the gift of prophecy often shows up in the marketplace. <laughs> like I don't just have the capacity to use my prophetic gifting just in the church or when I pray for somebody. God will use the prophetic gift in the marketplace very, very frequently. Um, and that looks like, you know, me just going to the grocery store, trying to mind my own business, and I'll hear Holy Spirit <clears throat> in his gifting whisper, go over to aisle 12 or take a run past the fruit stand or go head over to the milk or, or not even, it doesn't even, he doesn't even always speak like that. I'll just find myself thinking, oh, I think I need cheese or you know, just whatever, because the gift of the Holy Spirit in me and the fact that I yielded to Holy Spirit is, is routing me into my gift for a divine purpose to serve somebody else. And by the time I show up there, that gift of prophecy, prophecy is being stirred up, <clears throat> and now I connect it with using the proportion of faith that I have to, to speak a word to somebody. Normally I will see somebody in that aisle at the grocery store or uh, recently the last couple of weeks, I've really, I've really hit this gift really strong. I worship in the park a lot and people are uh, naturally drawn to that display. And I can almost guarantee that, <clears throat> excuse me, when I'm worshiping in a public place that God is going to bring somebody and that my prophetic gift is going to be stirred up and the proportion of faith that I have to release a word is going to come forth. Oftentimes, Holy Spirit will just gift me with one thought, one word, and I have to connect it with the faith that I have to know that in my experience, he's going to give me the rest of the package. So oftentimes, I'll approach somebody with just, just this unction of, of a thought or a word that Holy Spirit has gifted me with on their behalf. Um, oftentimes, like for example, a couple weeks ago, I was uh, in a motel staying with um, a spiritual daughter who was here visiting from uh, Australia. And <clears throat> she booked us a room and I stayed with her and she checked out and left. And um, I kind of lingered in the lobby for a bit. And the receptionist behind the desk walked by where I was on my laptop. Um, doing coffee or something. And as she came back, I just had this quickening in my spirit. Um, and I felt like I heard the Lord say, she needs to hear from me. Well, that's my cue. That's, that's the Holy Spirit stirring up my gift. He's blowing his breath, his word on those fires, um, on those embers, which I have kept aflame. And right there and in that moment, the rest belongs to me because I know that's my commission. Um, when he says to me, she needs to hear from me, that means, Rosie, are you going to get up and give her a word? And so I did. I was quickened to attach my faith, as I have written, 
how to stir that prophetic gift. I, I shore up my, my faith and I, and I approached, I approached her and I always falter with my opening line. I'm like, Lord, I just need a really good pickup line, if you will. I've always told him that. And he has yet to really equip me with that. So um, he lets me fumble. But initially she was by herself. It was, uh, I try to, to catch a moment where it's not a lot of distraction. But anyway, she's, she's at her desk and I went up to say thank you for allowing me to stay. And I said, can I share something with you? And now she's making eye contact. She said, sure. And, um, and then I just began to fumble. I said, well, I'm a minister, and I just felt like I heard God speak to me on your behalf. And then I just released my faith, <clears throat> and the words followed. And what God spoke to her was, um, he said, uh, that, of course, that he loved her. And most specifically was that he heard, has heard her cry. He has heard her prayers, that he is moving on her behalf and things to that nature. And before I finished, she had thrown her hands over her mouth, just tears rolling down her face. And she said, do you just say that to everybody? And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, I barely say it to one person. I said, no, beloved. I said, the Lord specifically gives me uh, insight and words for each individual person that he's asked me to share with. And she just began to weep and she uh, came out from behind the desk like there was a door she had to go through to come around to my side. And she just took off like she'd been shot out of a cannon, went through that door and came and just threw her arms around me, just crying. She said, I've been praying, I've been praying, I've been praying. And I said, you know, tears were rolling down my face at that point as well. And I said, obviously, and I'm here to let you know that God has heard your prayer and he wanted to make sure that you knew that. So <clears throat> that's sort of the, the, my testimony and my pro prophetic gifting. Number two, serving. If your gifting and your calling is in serving, you're going to stir that gift up by thriving to serve others well. I admire those that really, I, as we all should, I'm not, not to isolate that. We're all called to serve, of course, but <clears throat> it's, it's, specified as one of the grace gifts or one of the specific gifts to be stirred up. And so, you know, many of us will serve, but those that have the deposit of the gift of serving are going to outserve all of us. They're, they thrive. And I love how Paul writes that to thrive in serving others. Well, <clears throat> if your gift happens to be teaching, for example, you, Kim, are a teacher. I am a teacher in my job. So the way we can stir that gift up is to be actively teaching and training. So I know that in part of this, um, maybe some of you are already thinking, well, yeah, but Rosie, how, how do I stir up my gift actively teaching and training if I'm not actively teaching and training? Well, then we just take it right back to Holy Spirit. Because we recognize that we do have this gift, that we've been utilized in that gift before. And if the door is not open, if you will, to be actively using that gift, then we just take it right back to the Lord. And, then, and that's part of the process of stirring it up. You give it back to him and say, Lord, you have given me this gift. I need you to stir it up. Open doors or give me ample, oh, geez, hold on up, oh, sorry. Hey, ample opportunity. Ample opportunity to use this gift. Be actively teaching, actively training, actively serving, actively prophesying. Number four is the gift of encouragement. I think Andrea uh, is probably one of the uh, strongest giftings in this area, although she would probably disagree in her own home world. But we saw her post about that to her son the other day, and it was such a confirmation to me. But I think um, she carries a really strong gift of encouraging. And <clears throat> to stir that up is to use it often to encourage others. Most people that, in my opinion, that have a prophetic gifting will also be partnered with a gift of encouragement. They just go hand in hand, as many of these giftings do. Um, gift of service will also uh, under, undergird a gift of teaching. 
um, giving and serving will partner, leadership and, you know, all of these gifts will partner. And oftentimes we, we carry um, aspects of each and every one, but I believe that there are going to be um, the gifts that are going to flow and be the strongest within us. Um, I know being uh, on the Catch Fire Worship Flags team and in any aspect, um, Andrea is very anointed, truly an anointing to um, encourage us as part of her team as she does the whole entire Firecatcher tribe. It's just like she'll just be quick through Holy Spirit and she'll just drop that in such a divine timing. It's just so um, uh, obvious. I think in my opinion. Number five, giving, the gift of giving. You stir that up by giving to meet the needs of others. I love giving people, people that have the gift of giving. Um, I think uh, one of our fire catchers, Jennifer Bennett, I, and uh, Johnny, Joni, Joni Ritter, she, these two girls are saturated. <laughs> Sorry. They are saturated in the anointing of Holy Spirit in the gift of giving um, and stirred up by giving to meet the needs of others. These gals, like no other people I have ever known, even um, in, my, uh, in my local circle, if you will, have I ever met two who are so um, excited, like truly excited in their gift of giving. It's just, it blesses me so much. I have, like over here, I have my whole, Joni display of all of her gifts and behind me I have gifts from Jennifer and just they are so generous. Um, and number six, the gift of leadership. Stir that up by being passionate about your leadership. I know that um, the gift of leadership I think belongs to all of us in the body of Christ as a general rule. Um, we, are, we are called and set apart and if we're not following somebody, we're leading somebody. Somebody is always watching us as we go forward to do what we do. <clears throat> I know that some people would balk at the idea of being a leader, but um, like I said, <laughs> sorry, here to tell you, we are all leaders in our own right, whether we're leading in our homes, whether we're leading in our jobs, whether we're leading at church or the body of Christ, or just leading walking down aisle 12 at Safeway. We are all leaders and we are, according to the word, to be passionate about that. Um, I know that being a leader can feel intimidating if you want to like wear it as this um, endowment. But I think if you take off the, uh, the concept, and I, hear me correctly, but take off the concept of an entitlement, oh, the entitlement of it, and then gird it up under serving, I think that leadership is. I love the phrase servant leaders. I think that um, that ideology um, should be a theology in my opinion, servant leaders. Um, because I know in the gift of leadership, people uh, have a tendency to wanna create a hierarchy. Oh, he's the leader, she's the leader, they're the leader. But when we, when we aspire to servant leadership, we, I believe it's more of a arm in arm walking visual where um, we're all leaders and we're all aspiring to serve others um, so they can get to their place. Um, number seven, the gift of compassion. I, our model in all of these, of course, is Jesus, but I think Jesus was the greatest example of the gift of compassion. Um, Paul says to stir up the gift of compassion by flourishing in your cheerful display of it. Um, compassion oftentimes is not easy to walk in, <laughs> um, but it's part of the, the gift and the calling, the anointing that allows us to extend compassion. And of course, love, the gift of love is the primary, as I alluded to um, in the first scripture. All of these gifts are, um, <clears throat> are done by, for, and through love, as we say at Catch Fire Worship Flags, love and only love. Because we can have the most eloquent of speaking gift, we can have the most powerful prophetic gift and leadership, but as we know in 1 Corinthians 13, we can do it all, but if we're not doing it in the anointing and the spirit of love, 
we are just a clanging cymbal and a banging gong. <laughs> Ain't got time for that. Um, I've noted to guard your gift. Don't neglect it. Protect it from the weapon tactics of the enemy. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7 also says, For God will never give us a spirit of fear, but a Holy Spirit who gives us mighty power, love, and self-control. Some of the, the things that I've listed to guard ourselves and our giftings, um, I've just, you know, some of these just came to mind as I've had to walk through them. Uh, guard against discouragement. I think right there in our lives, not even just relevant to gifts, but life in general. Um, this last year for me has probably, well, last five years, but coming round the bend this last year, has been discouragement could be the highlight, could be the title of the story or the chapter or the book. But I had to continue, of course, to have faith and trust God in all things, as we all do. But even as um, we're moving, say, in our ministry of worship and praise and flag ministry, discouragement comes when, you know, um, over to number seven, where we're feeling rejected, then they partner together, discouragement and rejection, where, you know, leaders aren't recognizing us, or pastor says, no, you can't flag, or you were hoping for that solo or that opportunity or this or that or the other thing. And, and um, we're told no. And so if there's already a wound in us, then that's a place where the enemy is just going to hook immediately and say, see, they don't really like you and your flag ministry sucks. It's just all of that nonsense. And so we have to guard it, guard it, guard it, guard it, guard it. Guard it with all your heart and ask Holy Spirit to guard it for you. He is our rear garden, our fore garden on every side. He's our north, south, east, and west, and especially those places in our heart that really need protecting. Number two, we need to guard our gift against apathy, which is just that lackadaisical, well, if I'm not using it, I'm losing it, and you know, doesn't really seem to be making a difference. That's a lie from the pit of hell, and I'll be the First one to stand up and tell it to you. That goes back to the to the um, the instruction of the scripture to begin with. Stir it up. You're being apathetic about it because you're not stirring it up. You're not fanning the flame and taking, dare I say, not taking responsibility for the gift that God has given you. And so guard against being apathetic. Number three, guard against fear because it goes right back to that verse. God is not giving you a spirit of fear. And I, I'm working on that one tremendously, a lot. Um, it has to do with, you know, we all know how to do the work, soul wounds, past history, or whatever. But as I mentioned, this last year for me has been incredibly fearful. It, in the aspect of being plucked out of one place, you know, sent to a whole different state, living with people here and there, never knowing what was going to happen? Who was going to take care of me? <laughs> you know, am I going to end up homeless in the street? <laughs> but just, just panic, not fear, panic. But through that emotional process, I had to grab hold of my gift and minister in flag worship because for me, there's no other place that I find a connection to my calling and to the purpose of my life without it. Because all of these things I've listed, they're going to come every single day, every minute if they can. But when, I, when we connect with our gift and calling and the certainty of who we are, I believe that that helps us to, um, uh, when we've done all to stand, is to stand. And for me, that's my flags or my go-to. Number four, guard against doubt. Um, there again. We, we probably all battle that in some aspect on a daily basis, um, especially, well, let me re retract that. God is always moving on our behalf. When, when our process and our purpose and our destinies are drawing closer and closer to us, I know for me that I'm like, 
this has got to be too good to be true because my life is always about hardship and hurtful things and tragedy and trauma. And when the good is coming as it is in my life right now, I'm like, <laughs> Daddy Thomas, Jesus, get on up in here. Because if I can't stick my finger in your side right now, I don't, how do I even know this is you? And so I, you know, fear and doubt, they're, they're very first cousins, brothers, sisters, whatever you want. But there again, I go back to the original condition, stir up my gift. What is my gift and calling? No. What is my life demonstrated? And what can I put my faith and trust in? Um, number five, uncertainty that goes hand in hand with doubt. Number six, insecurity. Um, I think so many of us carry in some aspects an, a bit of insecurity in most areas. Um, again, this is a, an area for me that I, I am working on even now. I'm like, I have got so many works in progress that it's like, good Lord, am I ever going to get done? It just gets to the point where it's like, ah! But uh for me, for example, I'm in a brand new relationship, and man, all of my insecurities are coming out. But again, I go back to my gifts, my callings, what Holy Spirit has already equipped me with, love and only love, and right back to, to worship. It all comes back to worship, and that's where I... Um, where I can gather every one of these, my rejection, the pride, the discouragement, the apathy, the fear, the doubt, the uncertainty, all of it, all of it gets consolidated when I worship. <laughs> because as we know, when we are in that throne room, when we are before him, when we are in his presence, there's none of that. Um, none of that exists as we are looking unto him, the author and the finisher of everything that we're trying to accomplish. So sorry. It happens every time. <laughs> um, then none of that exists. And what I, I find so uncanny is that I can step out of that place and five minutes later, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being bombarded with one of the, one of the eight, you know, evil spirits. <laughs> but, but we're empowered when we're in that place of worship. We are, we are more than we know. And that's where we can stand in the presence of God without doubt. And we gather and a fresh impartation, a fresh fire, a fresh stirring. It all comes from being in his presence. Um, under those notes, I have keep your mind and heart focused on what God is doing. What is the vision? direction, plan, purpose, and destiny that God has given to you? What has he given about you? And I have it capped. Write it right now. Be stirred by his promise to you, because won't he do it? And oh, come on now. That alone should cause us to be stirred up. And the scripture in Habakkuk 2, 1 through 3, I treasure which says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, quote, Write the vision and make it plain upon tablets or tables that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end, it will speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it surely mm -hmm. will come and will not tarry. And so I've noted that to keep our mind and our heart focused on what God is doing. And that's a combat to all the eight listings of, of uh, the places where we have to guard our mm -hmm. gift. Keep our minds set on what God is doing. He is doing something that will combat the discouragement, the fear, and the doubt, and all the rest of the requiem that comes after us. And I highly encourage you, me, us, to truly write a vision, make a direction, write a plan, 
write your purpose and write your destiny so you have it as a tangible thing. Because as the scripture says, make it plain so that he may run who reads it. And the first person, if there's ever anybody else that ever gets to read it, the one who needs to read it is you so that you can run with it. What has God told you prophetically about your life? What is the vision or the dreams or the direction and the plan and the purpose that God has spoken to you about your life? Write it down. Write it right now. And then I often display. I often will hang it up. I will often use a vision board um, where I've got, you know, pictures of what God has spoken to me. So I have that confidence and that assurance just to undergird what this scripture says so that they who see it will run because I need to keep my gift and my calling stirred up so I can keep running the race that God has set before me. I have no idea in so many aspects how God is going to accomplish what he has promised me. And that will oftentimes bring one of the top eight that will often give me fear or doubt or uncertainty or insecurity. But when I continue to go back and read what he's told me and, and verbatim, standing on his promises, being in the word, then I have stirred that gift up again and I am able to run again. So Habakkuk 2 also says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak. It will not lie, and it will not tarry. And I think in part what I love about that idea in connection with stirring up the gift is that when we have that vision before us, it's like um, the highway of holiness, which um, it's just kind of coming to me, so I don't, I don't remember the exact scripture. But the highway that uh, the word tells us is narrow. When we begin to run a race, follow the plan of God and the purpose of God for our life, when our gifts are being stirred up, it's exciting, but the pathway begins to, to narrow. <laughs> and that's the part where we have to continue to either vacillate about it or be undecided or continue to lock in and walk out. Oh, come on now. Um, but I believe that we are the ones who are going to, to by necessity, have a full functioning awareness of the gift of God that's within us, that we keep that vision before us, keep it plain, and know that when the distractions come, you know, those eight things and more, that if it doesn't align with where we're walking, that we just keep walking. I love how, you know, look <laughs> my prophetic drama, I love how when racehorses race, they have those blinders on. So they can neither see to the left nor the right, but they can only see straight ahead because what's to the side is, is, the, is the race, the, the competitiveness of the race that they're running, and they will be distracted by that. But when they have those blinders on, which I believe is the word of God, you know, our gift and our calling, knowing who we are, when we have those things that protect us, then our race is straight before us. When we have the vision in front of us, then our race is set before us. We are not worried about who's running next to us, discouragement on one side and fear and doubt and insecurity. They're running the race. Right. Oh, come on now. They are running the race right alongside us, waiting and trying to trip us up. But, you know, I just, this metaphor is coming to me so strongly by the Spirit of the Lord. But we are called to run our race and it's Holy Spirit and the gifts and the callings that are the track that we run. We just, we just go. And we can do that as long as we continue to stir up the gift and the call within us. Keep your confidence alive and active. I've noted faith is a person, not just something we anxiously try to manufacture on our own. I included the scripture, Philippians 1, 3 through 6. My prayer for you are full of praise to God as I give him thanks for you with great joy. I'm so grateful for our union and our enduring partnership that began the first time I presented to you the gospel. I pray with great faith for you because we are fully convinced that the one who began this glorious work in you 
will faithfully continue the process of maturing you and will put his finishing touch to it until the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, there again, letting the word of God stir us up, partnering with the Lord and, and Holy Spirit and allowing him by his word, by the spirit, through our connection with others, um, begin to uh, look us over and help us to discern where and if we have let discouragement or apathy or insecurity or something pull our embers to the point where they're about to go out. And it can only be a revolutionary work of Holy Spirit to begin to come and say, hey, you're about to go out. And I believe that if we are not utilizing our gifts, the word says that the gifts and callings are without repentance. And that's true. Of course, we know that's true. But what about when the embers go out? Whose responsibility is it then? You know, because as I alluded to earlier in the syllabus, our gifts and our callings are for the love and service of others. And so there's, um, there's a community of um, there's a community, oh, Jesus, there's a community to your calling. There's a community that's attached to your calling, which means there, there is a people group, and it's always about people. God, everything that he uh, imparts, rather, to us is on behalf of somebody else. And if our embers are burning out, if there's merely even a spark left, there's a community at large that's going to miss out. So who's, who takes them on? Who, who's called to, to a community that um, we're, not, we're not staying stirred up enough to care about, dare I say? Whose community does that belong to when I'm, I'm letting discouragement or distraction or apathy or something else rob me from the gift that was given to me, dare I say, from the very foundations of the earth from the moment that God conceived of me he took into consideration the full blueprint of what I would need based on what he would call me to do I know that in this last couple of years of my life where a few years ago I was <clears throat> I was running a race that was causing me a lot of trauma a lot of drama um, a lot of pain even though I was a 4.0 student I uh, had two teenage girls that I had adopted that were bringing so much drama into my life. I was uh, originally foster care, um, sitting at tables with counselors and social workers and caseworkers and, you know, state people and judges and juries and ju all of that and still going to school and trying to manage a family. Meanwhile, self-medicating to the point of barely existing while speaking and thinking that I, you know, I had something to contribute with this debaucherous state of mind, but God still, those gifts and callings were still in me. And as I alluded to earlier, they're, they're without repentance. But yet, the Spirit of God was, <laughs> had pretty much departed <laughs> in most aspects of that moment. But when I came through all of that, <clears throat> And I am out this other side of it, having, having had so many things uh, taken, relieved of me. God left only two things in my hand, a pen in one hand. I'm a writer. I journal. I um, communicate. I'm still a student. Anything that lines up with that pen, just like I read in uh, Habakkuk, making the vision plain. He left me with a pen in one hand and my flags in the other. So what I know about my life right now, he's narrowed it down to just these two things, which truly is glorious, quite frankly, <laughs> because like many of you, I have multifaceted giftings and callings and all of these aspects. I, I know I'm a speaker, teacher, um, missionary. I mean, bleh, who cares, really? But God just consolidated it. It's that highway of holiness. He narrowed it. Man, did he ever narrow it. And so my race to run down that highway of holiness with my gifts, if it doesn't have to do with a pen in one hand or a flag in the other, 
and it's not mine to undertake. And Holy Spirit is very um, diligent, dare I say, <laughs> to uh, remind me, look, I've only, I've narrowed your field down to two things. Um, there's no room for you to take up anything else. But going back to the, the uh, Romans 12 gifts, accompanying with that pen in one hand is, as I alluded to, a gift of prophecy, teaching, um, serving. Um, you know, in flag ministry, there's prophetic gifting there. There's teaching. There's serving. Um, so they all consolidate and work together for, the, for God's good, for God's glory, rather, and for my benefit. So with that in mind, go back. And oftentimes you can, like, online, you can Google, like, gifts, um, spiritual gifts. And then I would encourage you also to go back and study uh, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 12. Hold on. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 12 um, talks about other varieties of spiritual giftings. In there, um, Paul talks about the gift of word of revelation and knowledge, gift of faith, gift of healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, speaking in tongues and interpretation, and then over into four, chapter 14. So the you know, 12, 13, and 14, if you want to continue to explore your spiritual gifts, of course, over in Romans 12, there is a plethora to be able to help identify and mark who you are in Christ and how you are going to best be able to partner with Holy Spirit and serving others as you do what you do. So with that in mind, um, you're, we can unmic um, Andrea and open for discussion and questions. We've got about 15 minutes left. there was a couple of, of things first off what you just said roman or first corinthians 12 uh in the passion translation it says uh he calls them spiritual realities not gifts as if like they belong to anyone which i love because it's our reality under christ um but what would you say is the when someone, okay, so you mentioned like to start up and I know that you, you talked in general how to do that, but what are, what would, what does it look like in a day or a week of someone kind of, and I take that word to mean more like steward the gift as even as, because some like protecting the gift is stewarding it to me. Um, what, how would, what would you say is, like, what is the pra like, what does that practically look like? The stewarding and protecting part, you mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Great question. Um, I think first and foremost, protect, the way to protect it always is in the Word of God and prayer. Um, that's where, you know, we continue to discover and explore and identify the gift. That's where we have the opportunity to pray the word of God um, over our lives in protecting. Um, so prayer and study in the word of God. Um, I think uh, another way to steward is uh, for those of, <clears throat> that are uh, connected in the body of Christ as in attending a church. I would um, highly suggest that, you know, your gift and callings come into submission, if you will to uh, the covering of your, your pastoral or your leadership. So they can also protect and help you guard your gift. Also giving opportunity to uh, allow it to be used in the body of Christ and to allow partnership um, for others to help us steward our gifts as we you know, endeavor to fly out on our own. Um, those would probably be the top three things that I would suggest. What about, so there are a lot of fire catchers that are not attending a church or don't have what would you say to them are they discounted of course not um mm -hmm. i do think that accountability in some aspect to our gifts is uh 
just in my opinion, it's it's one of the um, it's a primary way to be able to protect our guests because I mean we all know somebody who's out there just doing their thing in in God, but really hasn't. Um, I want to be careful how I say. It. You know what I'm saying. They're just out there, you know, uh, a, a free agent, doing it all on their own. And oh, you know, the ones that you know. And, and I be careful how I say this because there's room for um, affirmation and, and describing. But the ones, you know, well, I just do what God says. I'm only doing what God says. Well, that's awesome. But have you checked that with anybody else to just get? Confirmation, because I believe that confirmation is also a way to protect what you're doing. I just, I believe in accountability. That's probably, to me, that's just imperative. No, that's good. I, I remember um, Sean Bowles hearing him once, and he was, he was talking about particularly the gift of prophecy, how um, prophets prophets can be can be strange and um there would and because there's he he met he shepherds a and pastors a prophetic environment lots of there's freedom for prophecy to be happening and so to utilize those those gifts but he had said when before someone brings a word and he asks them and i don't know if he really does but he asks them like who who did he spend his birthday with la their like their birthday with like in, in their last their last year and it wasn't a matter of do you celebrate birthdays or not but it was like are you in a relationship with anybody mm -hmm. and I, I i thought it was a really like don't tell me that how gifted you are tell me how connected you are yes, yes. and um i think so Thank you for clarifying that for, because there are a lot of hurt hearts that have been rejected and are not part of church. And so you're not, you're not out. You are, uh, like you can still be in community and in relationship and with accountability. So thank you. What would you say are some un like unhealthy ways that we sometimes that that we sometimes guard our gift or stir up the gift um I, I think it drives kind of from the same scenario if we are an island unto ourselves and think we be all that and a piece of cheesecake that's <laughs> you know, just delicious but okay. <laughs> yeah but um just that that that, that pride and that um, being, not being teachable, um, not being open to learning from others um, who have, uh, you know, gone before us and are wise, wise mentors and teachers. I believe that God always provides um, mentors and teachers in every field that we walk in. There's always going to be somebody that has gone before us. And it just, I love how you said it. There, Andrea, it's just, you know, who are we connected to? Um, and I, th I think pride is exclusive, uh, well, not exclusive, but a primary, where, um, you know, when we are overlooked, you know, thinking that we should have been considered, but are overlooked, I believe that that's God's, truly God's hand of grace over us. I mean, I will be the first one to stand up and say, I have done it so many stinking times where you know, you talked about having a word where I just, you know, <laughs> thought I could put anything out there. And it was so out of line and wrong timing and just all of those things. And it's just, it's just not okay. <laughs> it's just, but also the grace, you know, to be able to, to take a step and do it wrong. But, but there again, what did I learn? Um, you know, my, my oldest son always says, and what did we learn? <laughs> but, but if we're not learning or not staying teachable and continuing to operate in that, it's, 
Not a good, not a good outcome. I don't know if that really answered that very well, but I, I think it's just staying connected and allowing somebody to check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> it's just sort of my philosophy. <laughs> I think what you just, uh, I like what you <laughs> check yourself before you wreck yourself. It's good. <laughs> but the, I think um, even just what you said, one of the unhealthy ways is to never make a mistake. Like you can yeah. guard your gift so much that you don't actually utilize it because you don't want to make a mistake. And hopefully where you're exercise like that's another kind of get yourself in community uh, with even people who don't always agree so that you can make lots of mistakes like i love what they teach at bethel is like if you're not making mistakes you're not growing and expect to make lots of lots of them yeah <laughs> and so um yeah, so the an environment where you can make mistakes is, I mean, it it goes for the person who is who is growing, and also the for the one who leads or pastors the group to allow messes to happen because that's it's messy, it's really messy, and so we have to be teachable, but we also have to remain unoffendable. Yes. Yes. And I think that's it, that they go hand in hand. To be teachable is to be open to the information that's being given us, whether we agree or disagree with it or not. There has to be an honor system in place to just, you know, eat the meat and throw away the bone, if you will. That's, I love that point too, Andrea. So Julie, uh, she doesn't have, she's not on, but she says, thank you so much for sharing these truths and encouragement. Um, does anyone else have a comment, question, testimony, story sharing that they, otherwise we're gonna wrap it up? Okay. I, so Rosie, thanks for sharing your heart again this morning. Uh, and just teaching us and leading us into this. I mean, it applies to everyone. If you are a Christian, this applies to you. So um, thank you so much. And, uh, and with that, did you want to pray, pray us out and then I'll stop recording? Of course. <clears throat> Father, we just, we thank you that you are such a generous gift giver. And Lord, I just, I release the, um, the working knowledge, um, understanding, and discernment to your beloveds that you have gifts for each one of us tailor-made to suit us and all that you've called us to do. So Lord, I release that by way of your word and according to your word that says we are called and gifted in all that you have set our feet to do. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being our partner, our teacher, our counselor, our paraclete, um, we just, we lay all this information at your feet and we ask that you would distribute mm -hmm. to us accordingly. We give you the glory and we thank you for sharing your supernatural capabilities with us. And we ask that God, you would, you would partner with, um, help us to partner with those that would help us to be able to distribute the gifts in magnificent ways that are always going to advance the kingdom and give God glory. And I lose that. For, um, for your glory and for our benefit. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen and amen.